welcome to the Dance Centre podcast. I am your host, Claire French, and I'm joining you from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, also known as Vancouver, Canada. I'll be talking to dancers, choreographers and other members of the dance world here on the West Coast to find out more about their creative work and practices and to discuss what it means to us to be dance professionals today. Thanks for joining us. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Alana Gericke, who is an accomplished everything, really. Scholar, dancer, lecturer, the list goes on. And I'm really excited to talk about all of those things with her. But I'm also talking to her because she's artist in residence this year at the Dance Center. And we are talking, or will be talking, at the beginning of April. And the podcast will be going out after International Dance Day, which is April 29th. Alana will have done a performance kind of event that we will be talking about today, but we are talking about it pre-event and um, the podcast will be going out post-event. And I think that's nice for context, but I think it's also a really wonderful opportunity to be able to talk to Alana at any point, but particularly at this point, as, uh, as she is always between and in process and production for things. Um, and so um, without further ado, I welcome you, Alana. Thank you so much for being here. Really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for having me, Claire. I would like to get into a discussion about many things. Um, <laughs> I would think we'd I'd love to start about your actual physical practice. Of course, it can weave into discussion about, uh, you know, all of the other things you do, because I, I think separating them can sometimes be a little bit problematic, perhaps. No, cause we don't want to really over-categorize, but at the same time, I, I, I'm really fascinated to know what your physical practice has become, in a way, if you uh, would like to start there as well I'd love to hear it yeah sure yeah thanks again for having me and maybe I'll just for folks who this is a podcast so you can't see me so I'll just kind of identify myself I am a white cis female woman I have a mixed European ancestry and I've been living and working as an uninvited settler on the uh, ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the tsleil people for, gosh, two decades. And I am deeply grateful to be here, and that I think is actually an appropriate way to introduce my physical practice because a lot of what I've been working on in the last while has to do with relationship to land and really working through my physical practice to develop a, like an increasingly, I hope, finely attuned relationship with the lands that I'm on. Uh, so this has kind of taken a, a few different forms, but right now I'm, and maybe for the last half decade, I've been really curious about, about kind of uh, an embodied version of land acknowledgement, which comes out of research that was led um, by two wonderful colleagues, uh, Jen Cole and Melissa Paul. They um, organized a working group through the Canadian Association for Theatre Research that I've been part of that has to do with kind of Indigenous settler relation around performance. Um, and one of the tasks that, that we as the working group were set to was um, developing a land acknowledgement that felt appropriate, kind of understanding that land acknowledgements have this important but problematic history, um, institutionalized history, etc. And I found that what I was offering to that was like a small dance, essentially, kind of drawing from Steve Paxton and, um, and that lineage. Uh, it was uh, really standing, in this case, in the rain, and just trying to um, attune with sort of a whole body sense uh, to the land that I was standing on, that I was moving through, that I was feeling fall on me. So that kind of just really like close study of, of somatic experience has been something that I am really curious about. I'm curious about it for myself and I'm curious about it as an access point and like an ethic almost uh, for other bodies to trained in dance or not. I think that it's, I think that it's one 
offering that as a dance artist and dance scholar, I can kind of make to the larger project of being in better relationship with, with land. That's beautiful. Thank you. One of the things it's making me think of is this somatic, as you said, this kind of kind of inner visioning, if you like, or inner kind of um, connecting and feeling like a, a, the visceral feeling to land, like the sense of place, grounding, attention um, to the air, to the atmosphere around you, all of those things. And I'm wondering about, for you, what relationship that has with another body. That's something I'm, you know, very much in, intrigued by and, and interested in, in my research, you know, both scholarly and in the in the in studio practice. And so I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. Or I think in, in that way, I'm saying kind of an interconnection, maybe across bodies that don't maybe have the same awareness, but like you said, access to ways of being and ways of attending to space. And the difference between kind of making people aware of that as an access point and then different ways of people actually showing that or Mm -hmm. themselves feeling that they have personal access to it. Could you, Mm -hmm. is that either part of your practice of interest at all to you or is there anything you, anything that that brings up for you? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot in there. Um, I'll bracket the question of showing yeah. showing it because that is big and kind of related to this sort of wild experiment that I'm trying on for International Dance Day. Okay, great. But yeah, I think the the question of feeling land, um, and I've thought of this in terms of like uh, topography. So some of the and I, and and this also reaches back to your earlier kind of flyby comment that it's hard to to tease apart the physical practice from the scholarship. For me, this is 100% the case. So in some of the scholarship that I was doing for my my PhD, I was um, spending a lot of time with Karen Jameson and returning to the river, a piece that she, a community engaged piece that she choreographed back in 1998 that followed the Brewery Creek corridor for 40 blocks. And it was an interesting piece to look at because there was really the the archive was quite thin for a bunch of different reasons. So there wasn't there weren't really easy ways to access the sort of visuals of the piece. Um, I ended up actually finding some stuff in the archive at some point, but when I was starting the research, it's it felt to me and to Karen that what might be appropriate would actually be a return to the site uh, to walk that same stretch. So we we did that. She was incredibly generous with with her time. And we retraced uh, the Brewery Creek corridor. And together, that was kind of a clicking moment for me where I think my interest in in that like nuanced relationship with land really settled in, in a new way. Um, because you could feel walking together the tilt of the land. You could feel the topography. You could see places where concrete was lifting um, from weathering. Uh, you could, Karen kept having us feel for the low spots in land. That was what she tried to kind of build her dance around, um, where the creek may have, you know, flowed. So there was this kind of like beautiful unison between our bodies, between like the really subtle back lean as we walked down this tilt, the shift into our heels the measuring of steps that that is necessary when land is asking you to move faster by by tilting downwards uh, that had nothing to do with us deciding to walk in unison it had everything to do with us just following the lay of the land so there was that i find really really interesting the way that there's a third fourth infinite entity that's involved in the choreography there that is not that's not a, a body right it has to do with the, the actual tilt of the land, or in that case of the land acknowledgement of the rain falling over, which hunches you. Like there are all of these physical responses that are in direct relationship to um, to our environment that I found really interesting. So that's kind of one way that I I found the those questions around land and body moving across bodies. But it also feeds into another practice that's been big for me, which is um, contact improvisation. Spent many years working with with Peter Bingham and a lot of what I feel like he would prepare us for was, um, of course, moving in partnership, but that would start long before you touched another body. So I think some of these ideas for me were seeded around those days 
on that beautiful maple, I think, floor at Edom, looking up at the green ceiling and just feeling the relationship with the floor um, and feeling that as a duet before I even touched another body. And then from there, of course, there's the contact improv principle around trying to feel for the ground through your partner. So always being able to feel their stability, their structural integrity, and and feeling that through a sense of of the floor, their relationship with gravity um, as it meets your own body. So maybe those are two two kind of responses to to that prompt around the way yeah. that that land body piece moves across bodies. Yeah, and thank you. It's uh, so uh, lovely to be given such specific context um, to talk about this in, but also for me that just the idea of the situatedness or the idea of attending together. And, and as much as I agree that you didn't make the decision to do something, it's the, it's the fact that you are feeling and seeing it together or attending together and there is a there is a kind of commitment in that, and the same, a commitment to the land that you are on, a, si- a commitment to the situation, mm-hmm. or to the situatedness, um, mm-hmm. and in the embodied situatedness that I think in both of those examples you've just um, described. <laughs> so thank you for that. That's great. Um, I, maybe we could stick with Edam just uh, for a little a little bit because I think that's uh, kind of nice nice and sticky. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> And, and and as you said, a grounding. So you were with Edam from 2006 to 2013, officially as a you know company member. How does Edam connect now to your practice? I noticed that on the website and then on your own website. Could you tell us what your website is? Yeah, it's just my name. Yeah. 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 Which is, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so there is a place where you can go to EDAM and, and uh, from there and link to it. And what I love about what you've done is you've linked to EDAM now <laughs> and to what they're presenting now. And there's something for me, this kind of constant engagement with learning, memory, bringing elements of the past into the future, like even from the archiving or the kind of setting up the context from as a historical context almost but also I think you have this amazing skill wonderful skill of bringing it into the present and just the connection between and not necessarily in terms of the stories that you've just told but contact for you or what Edam uh because I I still believe that there are there are principles of Edam and how you were as a performer there that still apply now and not necessarily to over categorize them, but could you just even explain that journey? Yeah, thank you. I'm so happy to talk about Edom. In terms of ha- the journey, like I for sure was drawn to that company and to the work. So I was thinking about this recently for something else. Um, and looking back at my own personal archive of making work, and looked back to like earliest days, so high school, before I really knew what contact improvisation was, before I re- knew what site-specific work was, our grad project, I went to like an arts-focused high school, and our grad project was to create three small pieces. And I created one that was a contact duet, again, before I knew what contact was. So there was always, there was a, it was a partner dance, and one body was always off the ground for the duration of the piece. And then the other two were site-based. One was in the lobby and one was outside. So I think like th- these have been interests for me that that kind of precede my formal training. And that said, I had a huge crush on uh, Edom Dance and the work that they were making for years before I started. I remember seeing Slip at the Roundhouse with Allie Robson, Monica Strelka, Delia Brett and Ann Cooper and just being like, like not able to speak afterwards. Um, so I sought, I sought that out. I, I showed up to Peter's classes. I really tried to um, learn as much as I could from him and was for sure it was um, pretty dreamy to be able to dance there with that group for that chunk of time. Uh, and just incredibly formative for me. I mean, I contact improv as a form is a lot of things, but I think one of the big takeaways for me is it like a retraining in uh, sensitizing, like a whole body listening on top of on top of other skill sets that I continue to use. That's one that um, that really shapes, I think, the way that I approach dance and movement and moving beyond dance in that kind of expanded sense. So it's really formative. I also have been curious about 
I mean, I'm talking about site specific work and I've mentioned mostly outdoor sites, but I, I'm also really curious about the studio as a specific site. Um, been working at, in the Woodward studio downtown a little bit lately and thinking about that like really contested site-based history of that studio thinking of Edom like there's a pet project I'll probably never do around like tracing how those buttery floors show up in dance aesthetics across Vancouver and beyond into Canada like I really think that what Peter has been doing there has shaped um, the way that so many of us move and and the just the floor texture in that space like the type of access to slip and gription I just think that it continues to live in my body for sure and I think that's like you referenced the past present thing that's something that I've been thinking about for quite a while Um, and I'm certainly not the only person I think of conversations that I'm having right now with Justine Chambers around this um, in terms of the the body as a as she thinks of it often as an archive of movement. And I think that's totally true. And I've been thinking of it too, as like a repository. So like, I, I mean, I was dancing formally with Edom, as you say that, that my um, last show with them was before my, I got pregnant with my first child. So that's what kind of changed the direction for me. So it's been years now, but, but I feel, I feel the movement patterning there in the spiral, in my spine, like on the daily, I feel it in a softening to the floor. So it's not past. It continues, it continues for sure to shape the way that I meet the world. Yeah. And how we do housework and how we do, you know, yeah. you pick up your children, move things around. Pick up your children hundred like, yeah, percent. Yeah. Breathe, I breathe even to a certain degree. There's totally. Kind of, uh, thank you again. Just so rich. Buttery is in my mind. We'll be there all day. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go back to eat them now and slide around. I know. And I'm, and I'm also just thinking of the, I, I want to say narrowness of the space, but it's not necessarily, it's not that it's narrow. Whoa. It's just that the depth of it yeah. means that it makes it feel much more rectangular than a lot of the yeah, it's it, true. And it also oblong, has maybe or something. Yeah, it has those like the space suggests it too, right? It's got windows yes. along one side, it's got doors at the other. So you're kind of yeah. oriented towards the doors. And it's got those long running, like the darker lines of wood that cut through it. So yeah, it feels yeah. that way to me too. So there's something and the way you enter the building mm-hmm. and then go, you know, turn and turn and there you are to the re- yeah. the rest of the building is that space. Like those kinds of things, the orientation of it and things like that. And then the, yeah. And it's the immersion within a broader art context, right? Like the artist run center of the Western front. I think, I just think that, that the type of work that's happened there has been shaped by its site and, and goes on to sort of um, influence a lot of what the rest of us are, are doing in the city. Yeah. There's like that kind of like the musicians are running up the stairs that you Mm -hmm. can hear at the side and the, (laughs) you know, the visual arts are next door and those kinds of things. And it, and it's been changing. I remember having a conversation with Andreas Carr in a coffee shop one day, because he told me that Western front was founded in 1973 and I just arrived in Vancouver in 97 or something. And I was excited because that was the year I was born. So I felt (laughs) like I've always felt an affinity with that building. Eden was formed in 82 and that's, that's the year I was born. See, (laughs) So we both have something really strong with that yeah, particular it's corner. A cosmic connection, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder if then um, we're talking about site, and I'd love to go back to, you've mentioned site-specific, but I am also very keen on your website, you called, oh, you mentioned the term place-based, and could you explain place-based as you mean it? Because I, I know you'll have, um, I know it's uh, deliberate for you. <laughs> Yeah. So I think one one way into this is I, I definitely do engage the term site specific or site responsive. And there's a lineage of scholarship around uh, site specific and site responsive art and performance. So using those words hooks on to that, that lineage. And I am also interested in the conversation around place-based creation and place-based work, which is a kind of cross-hatching but often different or parallel lineage. One of the pieces that I recently had the, the great privilege to pull together for Performance Matters Journal was a panel where I invited five 
dance artists based in and around Vancouver who focus on um, what I think of as sort of place-based creation to comment on their process. Uh, and one of the one of the things I try to do in the introduction to that article is to set up a, a bit of a critique of um, the site-specific conversation in terms of its kind of beholden, or it's nesting within like Euro-Western frameworks of thought. And often as really wonderful Indigenous scholars point out, including Zoe Todd uh, and Vanessa Watts, often borrowing and kind of recolonizing the cosmologies of Indigenous um, thinkers and doers. So that's, I guess that's one piece to really, that frames the way that I'm currently navigating and thinking through um, my own sort of beholdenses and responsibilities um, between those two different, and again, overlapping, I'm setting them out as different, but they, they definitely overlap. Uh, ways of thinking about place and site and there are I mean there are whole conversations around like nuances of site versus place versus space that I I maybe won't get into but I think that um, suffice it to say that each word can signal for um, in academic conversations and often in artistic contexts they can kind of signal that longer history of engagement so that's that's one of the things that I'm that I'm thinking about yeah, I'm I'm really happy to hear you use the term recolonize because that's been one of my concerns about drawing on some research that isn't directly addressing, which which seems to be almost like a it's a new kind of what's the word the uh, not adaptation but the appropriation. I'm I have to be I feel I have to be careful in research and especially in the written written word. I mean we should be in our conversations too, but that there's a fine line between referencing something to be aware of it, I'm going to use the word to show you know that mm -hmm. this exists, and then actually just being in that zone of referencing it and recolonizing it in the process because the frame in which it's being addressed is not thorough enough. And as you've used the word critique, and I think that's what academic work can do so well is offer that and frame it as a critique. And so it's very clear that that's what's happening. But the other thing that this all relates to for me is again, back to Edam and, and what you learned there and what you developed is this idea of um, responsibility and accountability mm -hmm. for the, the practice and for the relationship to practice. And I think that's where, for me, your research shows it in practice and in how we talk about practice and how mm. we um, contextualize the practice. Another reason that um, that place-based is interesting to me is because of the way that it can intersect with other fields of conversation. So there's a conversation around like land slash place slash site and movement in dance and performance studies. Um, but we know that there is a very active, vibrant and urgent conversation around place and place-based knowledge and place-based scholarship, et cetera, uh, that I'm interested in, I'm interested in bringing dance into relation with. So like many universities have, you know, uh, working groups on place-based knowledge that draw from all sorts of different uh, disciplines and faculties. And that is, that's an entry point, I think, like a big piece of what I have been trying to do over the last decade or so is is kind of like arts and advocacy work around the the social relevance of dance practice to these larger questions um, so that that's another sort of strategic move around the use of of that language so that brings brings us nicely segues nicely into that you're currently are you currently working in the urban studies and is mm -hmm. it your book that you're about to publish or you are <laughs> uh, you you're contracted to publish um and, and i think you're i know you i've heard, I've heard you read some of your um wonderful writing your approach to urban studies i wonder if you could talk maybe a little bit about that you sure, have, well, I think you have a little bit, so just now, but. Yeah, so I currently am a very fortunate to be supported by a Jack and Doris Shadbolt Fellowship in the Humanities, which is hosted in the Urban Studies Program at Simon Fraser University. So kind of wearing that hat alongside the artist in residence uh, at the Dance Center hat. And I, I'm really happy to be in the Urban Studies Program program in part because it kind of formalizes my own kind of self 
self-taught urban studies work over the past while. So yeah, the book project you mentioned, which I'm not quite ready, I'm a ways off of actually publishing, but it is under contract. That's great. So the plan is that it will happen. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, it's an examination of the, the urban, social, and spatial politics, I think of them, of site-based uh, performance in and around Vancouver. Um, and that's that's part of, uh, again, as I've already indicated, kind of just my long interest in in where dance is cited and my interest in what dance does. For sure, there's a whole conversation to be had around like affect and aesthetic of dance, but also I become really curious about how dance cited in offstage, how it just physically reorganizes audience members around it, how it changes changes our orientation to one another and to the the kind of daily choreographies of flow that we that we come to know and that the that urban design and the built environment and natural environment kind of um, if not dictate at least suggest for us and really interested in an expanded notion of choreography so in my the, this book that I'm working on is um, built out of my dissertation research. And, and in that uh, work, I found myself starting with an examination of a handful of site-based performances and looking at kind of the formal characteristics of those performances, but then quickly getting as interested in the informal choreographies of audiencing that would crop up around those performances. Um, so how some dances would invite uh, like a frontal orientation, others like a, like a, an Ariosa piece would have you like chest, you know, high lift, <laughs> look up. Let him lift to the sky. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> others um, have you like cast in the round. So what what is actually playing out in that kind of nested choreography of audience orientation? And then how that also exposed for me all of the those informal kind of everyday choreographies of urban urban passage so just by virtue of having say Paul Andre Fortier um, in the in the main square there at the mm-hmm. central branch of the VPL dancing so he's like the thing the, the object the aesthetic object um, and then framed around it you have this kind of uh, the seating the informal seating on the stairs outside of the library and then you have people who are just like, this like I call it curbside attention who are just kind of called to attention by this curious thing that's happening that they didn't know about and stop to watch for a bit and then carry on and then you have the folks who don't even notice what's going on who are driving by or who are walking by and the folks who like actively don't want to be asked for busking money or whatever their presumption is of what's going on who are made uncomfortable so it just really started to show me I thought I was going to be writing just really on the formal kind of art object objects themselves, but I found myself just getting um, really swept up in all of those nested layers of choreography um, that I just found completely fascinating and um, important in terms of uh, like our social interactions are that responsibility um, to land and to environment really fixating lately during the pandemic on the sidewalk corridor, especially those early days. So the way that the the two meter social physical distancing mandate would would show you kind of the the choreography of sidewalk passage and that narrow space and that strange temporary dance that we had to do for a while when we weren't sure how close we could actually get to each other in passing outside where you're trying to navigate like who's going to step off of the sidewalk so that we all have space to keep our kinospheres kind of completely separate. And (laughs) yeah. So for me, the, the question around urban studies is one of mobility um, and especially pedestrian mobility. And, and it seems to my mind, it's really um, interlaced with, with other choreographic concerns and, and those questions Mm -hmm. around formal choreographies. That's great. I'm a, and I'd love to have a conversation with you another time as well around this, because the informal formal is something I'm very interested in, the artistic and social in the studio environments, but also to kind of unformalizing maybe or thinking thinking of choreography as self-organizing mm-hmm. in the studio environment and therefore in performance. I'd love to just spend just a couple of minutes on expanded choreography, because uh, both of us, I think, are very 
very interested in this, but um, just to, so we don't do a flyby, like you said mm-hmm. before, <laughs> and just, just engage with it just a little bit longer, just for a couple of minutes on what we mean by that, what, you know, ideally what you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what I'm interested in when I think about expanded choreography is, is that shift between like formal and informal choreographies. So I'm talking about the the difference between dance uh, artists in ter- in sort of the high art realm or dancers in a more colloquial version doing dances steps that they <laughs> you know know or are are scored by an improvisation or whatever so where 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 the intention is dance that's kind of one version um, of choreography that I think. Uh, has been, you know, in parlance for some time. The the expanded piece for me is that shift really to thinking about, maybe I can borrow the performance studies frame of performance is versus performance as. As, So at the formation of, of performance studies, that was a key move there to think about what, how performance functions beyond the, the kind of formal, performance object and its and its effects so what what does it mean if we think about extend uh, dance from the project of formalized choreographies created by artists and performed by dancers or created for communities and performed by community dancers um, and and apply the notion of dance and like the frameworks of dance to just movement so taking some of the the principles and understandings that that we can derive from from a choreography proper and thinking about them in terms of passage down a sidewalk in terms of going up a step of stairs in terms of posture in daily flow in terms of organization of protests uh all of these all of these different manifestations of physicality of relationship of levels of speed all of these all of these principles right that we that we play with and experiment with in the in the project of choreography i'm curious about what what we can learn about our world by applying those ideas to to everyday movements mm-hmm. so for me that's the expanded that's the expanded sense great i'm a uh... Uh, thinking of it in relation to kind of embodied cognition and social cognition that I've been um, researching in inactive um, uh, or in action and the idea that you know there's social choreography the site specific that as you say protest is possibly uh, you know that also could be defined under social choreography in terms yeah. of it having its own kind of sense of Mm-hmm. intention you know kind of the, the mass behaving a certain way moving a certain way because of this idea of joined together in one thing the and the urban and expanded choreography goes further than that I think because it's not not everybody is behaving in a certain way going in the same direction for the same reasons all of those things so it's really kind of dif- diffracted maybe or uh, dispersed mm-hmm. um but there is still this idea of uh, purpose, which I think is really interesting that there's an in informality or informal, you know, kind of attention. There is still a purpose in our urban environments because it's kind of almost forced upon us um, by the nature of the design of a city or time in general. And so expanded and choreography together is really interesting for me because I think there's a lot of debate around whether or not it would still be considered choreography and maybe we need a new word. Yeah. And for me, like, I, I hear you. And for me, I think, I think the thing that I'm most interested in right now is, like, I think I mostly, oh, this might not be true. But that term is relevant to today. me right today. Now, in a second. <laughs> in the, in the kind of with my studies hat on. So like, I'm, I'm interested in dance as a way of knowing. And I'm interested in what that way of knowing can bring to the the other, maybe less intentional, less conscious um, ways of ways of moving that that characterize life. So it's that, yeah. I think there's a like whether whether or not it can be classified as choreography is a good debate to have, but it might not be one that I throw my hat in because I'm I'm just more interested in in the yeah the kind of in a, a refinement of a way of knowing that we can that we can glean when we think about 
when we bring our sort of choreographic framework to bear on a study of, of any old movement. Yeah. I think that's really, that really clears um, that path of study for me as well. Like in terms of just to open up just the perspective that there are so many ways of knowing and so many ways of moving is just delightful. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, I wonder if we can move then to, uh, let's move to the International Dance Day project, as we've said, pre yeah, the totally. actual events. <laughs> but of course, um, there's, we know it's, it's written that there is, a, it's score based, <laughs> that there's an audio element to it and that it is in the urban environment. So maybe those are the things we can kind of focus on a little bit. Mm -hmm. Score, I think is, you know, we're so familiar with that and improvisation score, but I think it would be great for you to just explain yeah. those. Yeah. Well, this is uh, like for real an experiment. Um, so we will see. <laughs> we'll see. I uh, have long been curious about offering audiences a way into the practice, the movement practice that I'm curious about. And I am uh, excited about a lot of participatory versions of performance. And uh, wanted to see if I could figure out a way to kind of develop a participatory model that would have the audience do the quote unquote dancing. So that's the idea with the caveat that the dancing that I'm interested in, as I said, off the top is kind of that really nuanced small dance that is attuned to urban choreographies. So the, so the dancing that the audience is invited to do won't I don't expect that it's actually going to look like dancing. Like it's not, it's not something to be watched. It's not something for folks who show up to experience this, to watch. And it's not something that's going to be watched from the outside. I don't think it's going to look like much. Um, I'm completely fine with that. So yeah, this is a set of audio scores that is designed to kind of invite audiencing bodies um, into into the kind of like nuanced relationship with sight that I am excited about. So I've been experimenting with how to get at that and I'm not sure that I've figured it out, <laughs> but that's okay. Where I'm landing right now is something that's kind of like a kinesthetic poem. Like writing oh, yeah. practice is big for me, um, yeah. academic writing and also performative writing. And so this kind of ends up being like a, an experiment in performative writing that's designed to try to attune, help folks, um, helps maybe the wrong word, but guide kind of an attuned um, relationship with, with the environment. And I think the one thing about this being an experiment is that the experience of the participants will be part of, you know, will, will feed that, will guide you and, yeah. you know, in, in how, it's worked or their insight will be huge, I think. Not that you never ever have to change it. Maybe it's always an experiment and that's the beauty of it because I think that's that's also that space we work in. I, When you say performative writing and academic writing, I, I don't think I ever do performative writing in that way, but I do creative writing. I do a lot mm -hmm. of um, novellas. I write a lot of those and, and poems, but I never bring them in never I say never so far I have never brought them into <laughs> my other work and I think one of the things I was just thinking of in your situation and I'm and I'm just this is really kind of just me fantasizing going into my creative writing head but I sometimes at in in an environment in the city where I start to try to guess what people do for a living <laughs> yeah, totally. or why they're there mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily use that for my writing but I just like going into that space and I am going to, I'm going to bet you, I'm going to bet on this, that the people who are involved in your projects will seem to have more intention about where they are as they pay more attention to where they are because of what you give them. And it may very well look like they are inspecting or surveying the area <laughs> in a, you know, in a complete, and not at all related to dance, as you say, like to a dance aesthetic. But there will be some, I'm sure there will be something there that, is legible 
Yeah, we will see. Their presence being more intentional. So I, we'll I, see. I'm going to go just to prove myself right. <laughs> no, I'm, joking. no, I'm joking. Well, I, I'd love I to. I hope yeah. you do come, and I would love your feedback. Oh no, I'd love to be there. Yeah. Yeah, um, and yeah, for me, writing has been, I think I've been experimenting with like a place-based version of writing for years now. Um, yeah. been really curious about what that would look like and also kind of reclaiming or reframing writing as an embodied practice, as a little micro choreography of, you know, scribing. Um, mm-hmm. So thinking about that as itself place-based and for me, I, a lot of my academic writing does kind of, it draws from again, circling back to how it how hard it is to separate practice from research in that way, from academic research, is that a lot of my writing draws from my experience inside a piece, whether as like a paid dancer or as an audience member. But for me, they, they really don't tease apart very easily at all. So this is just another kind of way to explore that. Yeah, I love that you say inside a piece, even as an audience member, because I'm completely with you on that. Mm-hmm. I, I, I find it really hard to talk about being a choreographer as an audience member because it, it's a third place to be. Like it's not the same, but it's still inside. Mm-hmm. Still very much feel like in part of the work. So I think that's mm-hmm. I think that's great. I would like to talk uh, just with you briefly about another community engaged project that I've heard about. But I know that as part of your artist in residence, and maybe it was proposal or ideas around that. You have this idea of a book club. Or critical <laughs> studies reading, and um, I know there have been a few series and um, uh, uh, the speaking of dance series, and mm-hmm. uh, well, the dance house one, and then this uh, the talking, uh, talking, thinking, dancing body, talking, thinking, dancing body. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I think that was Sufe originally, and Justine, and then Sufe Alexa and Justine, Madden. Yeah, it is passed down mm-hmm. in the in the community now. But I think what you're talking about is something a little bit different. Critical, mm-hmm. maybe critical dance studies, maybe just this idea of feeling having a space and a place to critique Mm -hmm. maybe wider issues maybe as opposed to critiquing performances or performance reviews or like you know we're talking about bigger issues maybe maybe political social I'm not sure but would you like to yeah Uh, this I'll say I'm not totally sure this is you're referring to part of the pitch for my residency and I I have to be honest that I'm not sure if it's going to if it's going to end up coming together, but the vision there, I can tell you about whether or not it happens this year or another year <laughs> was to, yeah, start with a reading, like a critical dance studies reading and invite folks to come into a studio space together and then try to move through some of those ideas. So talking would still be involved, but I guess the, the whole project would be framed by a notion that the moving body has access to a type of knowledge that doesn't make it onto the page. And that if we take some of some of the really important ideas that are circulating through dance studies right now around, like you mentioned, appropriation, that would be one um, around relationship to land and place there, you know, I could, I could reel off a whole host, but so what happens if you take those ideas uh, and you try to move them back into the body, right? Like they're built off of moving bodies in the first place, and then they live in the printed word and they circulate that way. So I was curious about what would happen if you bring folks together and then try to try to just explore those ideas in movement again, translate it back. And this is stuff that I've done in my capacity as a, as a sessional lecturer at a bunch of different institutions. Um, just really insisting on the moving body as as a knowledge holding entity that that holds knowledge in a different way, a different and important way from the way that it gets translated um, into words. So again, I'm not sure if that's going to happen now, but if it doesn't happen now, that's certainly a principle that cuts through my my teaching. Yeah, yeah. So I, I hope it happens. Uh, yeah. But it sounds like I mean, it sounds like you. you, you this is what. You, something you do anyway something I do so and I just happening <laughs> I just really insist as having gone into universities and and taught dance students who may or may not have like writing pedagogy and access to writing is writing skills basic writing skills is another kind of platform of what I feel really strongly about and um, I've just I've just met countless dancers and so many are fantastic writers and others haven't had don't have the confidence around that 
and and then feel that they they aren't doing the thinking and i just feel like i have this i don't know there, again there's this advocacy piece in me that's like well no you are embodying the thinking on the daily like that it's it's just translating it into a different form so that's i think that's a piece that kind of fires me up is just around these the ideas that are that are moved um that are physical uh and and some of them can make their way onto the page and some can't and I just feel like it's such a vital site uh, for knowledge and experimentation and like on the ground relation, you know, that I, I, I just think is really, it's really vital. Um, but the other community engaged piece that, that, is, that maybe I'll just say a quick thing about is, um, is a set of workshops right now that we're working on. Uh, oh, nice. Justine and I are working on with um, folks who are involved in an initiative called the cross-cultural uh, walking tour. And that's another version where we have a bunch of people from a whole range of different walks of life, and we're bringing them into a room together, but really just to explore their own embodied knowledge. So like they are the experts of their gestural history, and we're just kind of trying to create a space to explore explore that kind of more explicitly. So that, yeah, I think that's a through line for me, just a really strong knowledge knowledge of the of the information that moves through the body. Yeah. And the kind of understanding of the placing and replacing of that knowledge mm -hmm. and, and knowing, I think is really exciting. I think that the thing around writing or thinking and, and with dances is to, is also about confidence building in the processes of thinking, whether mm -hmm. they become, whether they remain as physical thinking in their expression but I think there there is something about that because I think it allows them to kind of take more risk as well and not seek perhaps not seek so much validation which I think is something that underlies the um, industry quite a bit and is changing because we have so many different voices who are uh, have different understandings of um, place and context and even what it memory and and history so I think that's wonderful that's really great okay that's a lot I think we've covered a lot of things um, <laughs> and it's been really exciting and I look forward to all the forms that your work will take and all of these ideas will take. And uh, this, as I said, will be going out after International Dance Day, but I hope that following International Dance Day, there will be some follow up and that we will maybe talk again but I'm sure you'll have your own documentation on all of that too. So we'll, we'll keep an eye out and we'll post in the description of the podcast where people can follow you. So for now, if there's nothing else you'd like to add, Alana, then I think we'll, we'll end it there. And uh, I just want to thank you again for joining me today. Yeah. Fantastic. And for your work. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to chat. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. We would love for you to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts, as this will help other listeners find us and help us to grow our dance audience. We'll be back next month. In the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook at The Dance Center, Twitter at Dance Center, and Instagram at The Dance Center BC. And if you'd like to support our work, please consider making a donation. Just go to our website at thedancecenter.ca where you'll find extensive information about our upcoming programs and events. The music for the Dance Centre podcast was composed by James B. Maxwell. Always a pleasure to connect with you through dance. Until next time.